And we are recording. All right. Um, so it's the last session of the day. I hope you guys are still awake. Uh, we are going to talk about, as you can see on my screen, hopefully, and Christian, please let me know if uh, something is not right, but here. Yeah. Um, best of both worlds, improve your decoupled Drupal with external personalization using Firebase. So uh, this is the, the URL. I have posted the URL in chat, so please uh, take a look at it. And at the very bottom of that, there is a link to the source code, not the very bottom, sorry. The all source code is available on this Bitbucket link. Now, I haven't put, pushed the latest code, so the code is slightly old. So tomorrow, by tomorrow morning, the latest code will be there. So this presentation is all uh, very coding oriented. So you'll see a lot of code. We, uh, I don't think we have enough time to do real live coding, but, but we'll still be looking at some code. Okay, so what are we trying to do? I have a website here. Uh, it's a Drupal website, looks pretty vanilla. And I want to, <clears throat> I want to be able to use this site uh, without, I mean, being logged in. The problem with the, uh, the reason why people go headless with Drupal or decoupled with Drupal is because, you know, Drupal is not super fast when it comes to, especially when it comes to logged in users. When you have a session, uh, the caching layer suffers because the user has a session, unless the user is looking at the same page over and over again, um, you don't benefit from caching. So wouldn't it be nice if all the users were anonymous to Drupal, but they were logged in uh, and known to you, the site owner. And that's exactly what we are trying to do. So uh, let me uh, log out from Drupal here. There you go, I am logged out. Um, but my goal is to, um, let me, I have a separate site uh, it's the same site, you can, you can use the same site and, and basically log in. I'm gonna log in using a separate account. Okay, so this is one, my incognito browser where I'm logged in. This is my main browser where I am uh, not logged in. And the idea is how can we use, uh, how, how can we use all the features of Drupal and also know our audience Maybe you want to, uh, maybe you are a, an e-commerce site, maybe you are a news site. So that's a very good example. If you're a news site, your staff, your editors, your authors and journalists, they will log in, they should log in. So they go into this, you know, uh, Drupal admin interface, but your audience, the readers of your newspaper, they should not have a Drupal login. So stay, because if they have Drupal login, you will end up with 10,000 or, if it's rather popular than millions of Drupal accounts. That doesn't make any sense. So you definitely want to keep them separate. And that's what we are going to figure out how to do that. So let's start with this module called um, component. So there is this very nice module called component project. So drupal.com and dot, sorry, not com, org slash projects slash component, this one. This is the module and it's a module that allows you to write, to just have a JavaScript application. It could be plain JavaScript, it could be compiled with some um, compiler such as React, Svelte, uh, ES6 or anything else. But in the end you have a .js and .css file or a bunch of .js and .css files. And those are the ones um, that will get loaded and those that JavaScript file can then uh, interrogate this, uh, the DOM and populate your block. So the whole, uh, so this JavaScript program uh, ends up running inside a block. So let me demonstrate. So um, here I am logged in, if I go to, uh, block layout. I have this demo component. I've written it and I've disabled it on purpose because I want to show you first. 
So if I configure, I'm not enabling it, I'm just configuring it. This is called demo component. It has a machine name of demo component and it has two component settings, uh, two end, um, fields in component settings form. Now let me show you what this looks like in code. Excellent. Yeah, so what does it look like in code? In code, let me go here. This is my Drupal directory set, I mean code setup. So let me, oops, boy. Why do I have this? Okay, so I go to my um, custom modules. Modules, custom, uh, and I have a module called dd underscore demo. And it is a very simple module. It has no source code actually inside it. It's just an info file, uh, name, description, type module. And then it has one dependency called Drupal colon component. And that's the component module that I was talking about. In And then once you do that, once you have a basic info file like this, you can have a directory called components. And in that components directory, you can have any number of star.component.yaml file. So let's start with the very simple one, demo comp.component.yaml. It has a name and that's the name you will see here, uh, demo component, right? So that's the name. Then it has a description. So there is, you know, there will be description somewhere in here. I don't know where. And um, it has two very important keys, JS and CSS. So you can add any number of JavaScript files. They can even be JavaScript URLs. They can be external URLs. And then CSS file, okay? Um, again, they can be multiple. After that, you can specify a configuration key under which there can be configuration fields. And the, this is standard Drupal um, forms API. So if you're familiar with forms API, then you know what, what type text field, me, title message, description, placeholder, default value required, and so on and so forth. So now as I'm configuring, I'm saying, hey, I have this, I need two input parameters, message and count. So I, I will say, hello, decoupled Drupal at GovCon, I'll say GovCon, okay? And the number of times you want to repeat that message is let's say, you know, three three times. And I will save this. As I save it, I wanna also make sure that it is enabled. So there is my demo component, it is still disabled and I enable it. So as soon as I enable it, now uh, in my, uh, sorry, in my, main not logged in session, if I refresh, I see this demo component block and it has um, the message repeated three times. So let's look at the source code, how this happened. And that is JS is demo comp slash Drupal main dot JS and CSS is demo comp slash styles dot CSS. If I open that demo comp folder, Drupal main.js is there. So the key thing that you have to understand is that the configuration that we set up, set in the config form is actually available in the HTML. So if I inspect, and this is where in the, as you can see, there is this, uh, this is my component div, sorry, the block div, and inside that there is a content div, and let's see. And then in there, there's another div called, and that has two attributes. I don't know if you can see this, let me make it a little larger. So it has two attributes, data dash message and data dash count. And it's no coincidence that it matches the uh, keys that we specified in the info file, in the component config file, message and count. And this information is actually available to us under data set. Uh, so if I inspect this and 
look at dollar zero. Sorry. What is doing? I'm not okay here. Yeah, if if you look at dollar zero dot data set, you will see the configuration that we provided count and message. So this is the information that JavaScript then leverages. Uh, so there is a selector, of course, and then eventually you just extract the, uh, the div. And from that div, you extract the configuration as dot data set. And that gives you the configuration. And now we are also printing that in, in console log, we are printing the configuration. You can see that. So here's the config count and message. Okay. So this is how you're getting information from Drupal. This is very crucial because from this point onward, you are completely, you can leave Drupal behind and you're completely in the land of JavaScript because now you can create any kind of JavaScript. This was the simplest, a sim, a very simple JavaScript application, but you can create something uh, super complicated. Now you guys, if you are JavaScript developers, then you might know, um, um, React, or you might use Angular JS or jQuery, or in my case, my favorite is Svelte. So just FYI, you guys should definitely check out Svelte. Uh, it is uh, it is a very powerful UI library. Uh, it's a it's not even a library; it's a compiler. But you will see some code. So let's uh, let's look at some Svelte code. I, we I have a second component. It's called Svelte Comp dot component dot yaml so this is a second component here the javascript can be so this is this is how you will probably send to production which is you know some build directory and in there you have a bundle dot js so this is what you will probably send to production but because i want to do live development i am pulling it directly from my dev server on localhost 5000 and i can do type external the great thing about that is once, if I do it that way, I can now, let me first place my, my component here. So I'm gonna place that, I have it already placed, I will just enable it. This is the Svelte demo component, I'm just gonna enable it. And this is very similar to the previous one, except that this is in Svelte. It has the same things like a hello Svelte a message and account. So once I, I enable this, Back here, if I refresh, suddenly I have the Svelte component. Now, this thing, the, the good thing about it is I can make live changes and they will be visible. So let me just show you. If I make a, a small change, let's say custom, what's it called? Demo comp, no, not this one, Svelte, yeah, Svelte. SRC and then Svelte comp has, this is my Svelte component app.svelte. And the main.ts is very similar. We are once again, just a query selector. We are using query selector to um, fetch that div with the data dash tags, the data set. And we are instantiating our Svelte component. So in the Svelte component, if I make a very small change, Um, just to show you that it's live. Uh, so here, if I say, so instead of, the, I can see zero colon and one colon and two colon and three colon. If I replace the colon with uh, equal signs, lots of equal to signs. So I, and as you could see, without me refreshing the browser, it it's doing live debugging, live uh, development, live loading, reloading. So if I undo this, and save it again uh, on the left, this thing refreshed itself. So this this is made possible because I am in my uh, YAML file, component YAML file, I am hitting the, the dev server directly, localhost 5000. So that's the benefit. So now let's uh, go f deeper into what can we do with Svelte and JavaScript? Of course, there's no limit really. So I want to, do uh, Firebase login. That's the that's the thing, because I want to be I want my newspaper um, 
readers to be able to comment using Firebase and even log in using Firebase, not log in to Drupal. That way, the best part is that Drupal can, can treat them as anonymous users and they are anonymous to Drupal which means Drupal can serve cached pages. In fact, you don't even have to hit Drupal if you use a CDN like Cloudflare or CloudFront or so, so many CDNs out there. Those CDNs will hit Drupal once in a rare while. For the most part, your uh, user, your viewers, your website visitors will not actually hit your Drupal at all. So I have a component for that. So here in my Firebase, uh, in my Swell directory, I have a directory called Firebase and I have two, uh, two or three components, or two actually. One is called login and the other is called comments. So login is, uh, is what we will use. So uh, I cannot go into the code for all this, but, but the good thing is I can, uh, let me just enable that component first. So there it is, login component. So this is the Firebase login, I enable it. I wanna show you the configuration. In the configuration you can, I have simply kept a JSON text area where I, I copy pasted my Firebase configuration. So if you have used Firebase, then you would know um, that uh, you can go to Firebase, your Again, if you don't know anything about Firebase, then this, then you you can look look at some of the videos that I have on my YouTube channel. Uh, but so here's my Firebase application, and I have authentication configured. So this is where people have logged in, uh, and this is uh, this is where I uh, I define the sign in method, and I have enabled. Google Google as a signing sign in method as you can see here. Okay. So the configuration can be obtained from project settings. And then if you go to the, the config tab, so there it is. This is the configuration. So I, I simply copy and copied and pasted that configuration here, but I had to strip out the JavaScript portions of it and convert this into valid JSON. Once I did that, this code is now available to my Firebase component. Once that, all that code is available, um, here in my uh, newspaper reader section, uh, session, if I reload, I suddenly have the login. But the thing is I was already logged in, so it's using my existing login. But if I sign out, it says you can sign in. Now, if I click sign in, I have two Google logins. Uh, one says jitesh at spinspire.com and another as jitesh at toshiland.com. So I'll switch myself to my Spinspire identity. Now I'm logged in. And as you can see, Firebase authentication has given that information to the JavaScript application. And right within, at this point, I am not logged. As you can see, there is a login link. That is the Drupal login. I'm not logged into Drupal. I'm only logged into Firebase. Let's see how we are doing with respect to time. Uh, what time is it now? 5.49, okay. So we have good time. So um, now how is the, uh, all that is working? Of course, all of this source code will be available. Uh, is available actually right now, but some of the latest, uh, most recent code is not. So basically, Firebase is is uh, is giving me the sign in and the sign out, and I'm using Firebase dot auth dot sign in with pop up. So that's what is causing this. Uh, when I click on this, the pop up comes up, and then I can use any of my identities. So this is the Firebase sign in, but this login with Firebase, of course is good if you want to authenticate people and then give them access to your newspaper. But um, what about uh, commenting? I mean, there are other things that you can do. Like if they are logged in through Firebase auth, then they can add comments. Now the com, unlike Drupal, com we are not using Drupal comments because that would require logging into Drupal itself. That's why we are using uh, Firebase uh, as our uh, database and then storing our comments there. 
let me show you. Uh, let me first enable that module. Uh, that sorry, not module, but that uh, block. So I have a comments block. There it is, Firebase comments. I enable it. This is also once again implemented as a component. So you will see I have Firebase login and I have Firebase comments, and that thing is. Um, provided to Drupal through Firebase comments.component.yaml. So this is that, okay? In the end, I'm doing all my JavaScripting inside bundle.js. So, so once I enabled that, I refresh, and I have some pre-existing comments. So these comments are being shown, and now I'm logged in as one of my two identities. So if I say, hey, uh, this is a live comment. So now I want to show you before I hit um, submit, I want to show you that here in the other session, if I go to the same page and I go to where's the front page, yeah. So if I if I leave if I put this browser right next to the other one, then you'll see what happens. As soon as I hit submit on this, give me a second, I'm trying to. Right, so this is one session and this is a separate session and if as soon as I hit submit here, watch what happens on the right hand side. That's right. So without refreshing, of course, all your, so this is this interact with each other in real time by adding comments, which of course can lead to some very interesting arguments. Uh, as you know, if you have a political article and uh, you know, you have people commenting on it from both sides of the argument, uh, things can get really heated. But any case, as a newspaper, you probably don't mind. Uh, uh, more user engagement, I guess, is hopefully better. So, so this is commenting system, and it is working uh, without the use of um, Drupal's comments. So, let me, let me, sh and obviously, all this data is sh stored in Cloud uh, Firestore. So this is where I am storing, uh, sorry, this DD govcon paths, this is the, on the node one, here are the comments. And as you can see, and there are some comments here, what a great article. And then the, the front page comments are, are stored somewhere here. So this was the, this is a live comment. This is the, the comment that is stored in Firebase. So that's uh, that's the use of Firebase. Now, all of this is done using uh, Firebase uh, SDK from Google as well as, um, wait a second, I'm not able to, I'm having some trouble with my computer. Why is this? Uh... Oh. Um... I don't know. Why is this? Uh, I'm not able to switch windows. Oh, now I can switch windows, but it's delayed. Okay. So the third thing is, what else uh, should you be doing with your JavaScript apps? One thing is, uh, the way you, you can look at it is you have an ocean of content. The Drupal is providing, you know, um, a lot of content, right? And then in there, you can have islands of application. So this sign in, this login is an island of application. This um, comment section is an island of application. As you can see, I'm not logged into Firebase here and that's why commenting input form is, is uh, disabled for me. But on the other hand here, um, I am logged into Firebase. So the comment input form is there. As soon as I log, sign out, the comment input form disappears. That's even better because, because this is one JavaScript app while this was a separate JavaScript app and yet they are synchronized with each other. As soon as I log in, sign in here, you will see that the 
the comment input form will will show up instantly see and they are not even the same javascript app they are separate bundle js so in any case um i want to show you one more thing which is if we go to uh, is i have a lot of uh, um i mean think about a conference like this one you know uh, govcon or any drupal camp or drupal con right there will be lots of sessions so i actually have that here if i go to my content i have a whole bunch of of sessions created these i am actually importing from a google spreadsheet like this one okay and again in the source code i'm sorry i cannot show you all of the details of the source code but i have an import a migration running that will import them so once i do that i can use graphql and let me show you what i'm doing with graphql um, in my drupal site where i am logged in as um, as admin i can show you that in graphql i can run i can run arbitrary queries so i have one such graphql query already um, ready to go so it's called sessions query dot yeah sessions query so if i copy and paste this let me just copy this and if i paste it and run the query i'm getting a whole bunch of graphql results so this combined with uh, so the I can run this query from my JavaScript application. And uh, so let's do that. So I have a JavaScript application created. One more, uh, it's called, it's called session schedule. So I have this session schedule um, app, which is also packaged as a component block so there is the session schedule component yaml it is taking some query id uh, because i don't want to put the whole query in on the client side i just want to put it an id which i accomplish using query maps again i'm sorry i cannot get into details of that but query maps are very powerful these are persisted queries the good thing is you can uh, write your query once compile it import it into drupal and then the uh, and then it is it gets assigned a, a hash code like this which you can use uh, from your javascript client and you can now issue http get request as as you know a lot of people have a complaint against uh, graphql that um, you have to use http post which is not cacheable but now i can do http get request and the second thing is in graphql regular graphql you would have to open up too much in terms of permissions so if you go to um, permissions uh, you will see that i have not given all the permissions i have given very limited permissions so that as you can see only the execute persisted queries i have not given execute arbitrary graphql requests so let's uh, demo this I go to front page. Okay, I don't have, I, I need to enable this. So let's go to structure block layout and enable the schedule, the session schedule application. There it is. So I enable it. As soon as I enable it and uh, by the way, feel free to ask questions if you don't want to interrupt, then at least in the chat. So, okay. So, if I refresh the front page now, there's my session. So this is this is a, a good example of where JavaScript can really do things that uh, that are hard to do in Drupal. Very hard to do in Drupal because look, I have a very a nice looking schedule and the data for this schedule came from this migration spreadsheet and there's the start date start time 9 a.m 10 uh, 9 to 10 and then back here 
I have the same 821, 822, and it's uh, showing as 1 p.m. instead of 9 a.m. That's because, uh, unfortunately, I didn't adjust for uh, the uh, universal time zone. So I'm in East Coast, Eastern time zone, and 9 a.m. In, in Eastern time zone is actually 1 p.m. in uh, UTC. So that's what it's showing. In any case, um, as you can see, if I'm when I'm switching from one tab to the next, maybe you can see the uh, animations. So all of this is JavaScript uh, application. And this data, the best part is the data came over, let me show you the network request. The da data is coming over a get request, not a post request. Let me just reload. I just hit full reload. This is my GraphQL request. Let me just expand this. That's my GraphQL request. The one thing you should notice about it is that GraphQL request is a get request, not a post request. And the request itself, the URL is GraphQL slash query ID. And here's the query ID. This, this is the query ID that we sent, uh, we set in the configuration. If you if you look at the configuration of the session schedule, that's the query ID. So, so this becomes a GraphQL post to a GraphQL get, and that means it's cacheable. Um, and the other thing is, I'm using Svelte. It has, um, you know, a, a JavaScript compiler, which integrates very nicely with, uh, you know, browser UI and DOM. So that's why I have these transitions, as you can see the animation, animated transitions. Mm. Now you can do more. You could, so I have other examples where people, people would basically favorite these sessions and you would store that into, into uh, Firebase. So let's, uh, let me just go a little bit further into uh, how the Firebase portion of this thing works and what Svelte can do, okay? So let me see how I'm doing with respect to time. Okay, six or two. Mm, I wanna give you a, I wanna, now, now that I've, I've rushed through the whole thing, let me do this a little more slowly so that you can understand how I built the whole thing. So, let us uh, create a whole new component live. So let's do this. Um, so I go into my custom module and into the, the components directory and open a new file. I'll call it govcon dot component dot yml right in here i have to write name so let's say govcon block okay description you can write of course um okay let me just look. yeah description and sorry where is the Okay, let me just look at uh, another component for some inspiration. So there's name, description, JS, CSS, and form stuff. So let's do that. Um, JS, CSS, form, configuration. These are the keys. Of course, there's a description. In JS, we just have to give the path to your JavaScript file. So we will say govcon.js, or maybe it should be in a folder. Um, it doesn't matter. We'll just say govcon.js, and the the value side is empty. It's an empty object. Uh, I think it's a good idea to put it in double quotes. So that and the CSS similarly. And then form configuration will omit for now. So once you have this, let's create a govcon.js and govcon.css. 
So new file and call it govcon.js and console.log this is govcon component. Okay. And I can create another file govcon.css and we'll put some some I don't know what what we want to put, but we can just put some um, styles here. But let's start with the govcon.js. Okay, um, we can now flush cache. So obviously, we have to flush cache in order to um, see this new component. Otherwise, this component will not be presented to us in the block. Um, layout. So we come here and then we'll add this to the footer. So place block and look for govcon. There it is, govcon block. That's because we had a dot, that's because of this component YAML file. So let's place it. Why not? Sure, display title. Why not? So save these blocks. And now when we go to the front page or any page for that matter at, in the, at the very bottom we have govcon block but it it is not showing anything inside the block so if you look at the console here uh, hopefully we will have uh, this is govcon component so this is the evidence that our javascript got attached to our uh, to this block now, how can we get some more information about uh, the uh, our environment, about the div that we are inside? And that's something we can do right here by, you have to actually uh, inspect this element. And as you can see, you can say, look for this component called block-govcon block. Oh, that's the ID, so our block component. Yeah, so look for block component. And within that, look for content div. And within that, there is this class govcon. This is what we are looking for. So we say document dot query selector block component. Is it? Block component? Block component, yes. Then content, and then govcon. Isn't block component Content, the ID? sorry? Isn't block component the ID rather than? I cannot hear you. Can you sp speak a little louder? Isn't block component the ID rather than? Right, right, right. Class? Oh, it's a class. It's a class. So yes. So uh, yeah, that this one. See this? This is a class, block dash component. That's a class. That's right. So you save this, and now you can you will get um, the div, and you can we can just console log the div. And the most important thing is the why do we want this div? We actually want to get data set out of it. So our configuration. So div dot data set gives you the config. Of course, in our case, we have no. Um, okay, let's let's re, uh, refresh this and see what happens. So there is config is the. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. Yeah, this is the one. This is the govcon component. That's the div, and you can see if if I hover on it, you will see. Okay. So that's the div, govcon div, and the, conf the config is empty because there are no configuration uh, items. So let's add one. I will just say, hey, um, message. So this is a, a key, then type will be text field. And then, mm, I don't know, required, true, uh, oh, most importantly, uh, the title. Title will be uh, govcon message. Let's call it that. Let's save it, save this. 
we go back to Drupal and flush all caches. We have to do that every time we change the info files or YAML files in general. So now, if I look for, for my GovCon uh, block again, I should see, there you are, message. So I can just say, hello, GovCon. So I save that. So once I have I save that, you can, um, if I refresh it, my configuration, you see, has that information, hello GovCon. Now I can, in my JavaScript, I can simply destructure that or, or somehow uh, put that. Uh, I can say, hey, take my div and make its inner HTML equal to, uh, let's say, heading one, heading, say heading three. I'm using interpolation string, inter I don't know if it, that will work, so let me not do that. Um, heading three plus config dot message, oops. Config dot, oh, come on. Config dot message plus heading three. And now if I re refresh, sorry, let's go to the bottom and do a hard refresh reload. Hopefully govcon block, it didn't actually, oh, config is not defined, sorry, my bad. Uh, the config, it's not called config. I, I, I never assigned it to config. So I should say let or var config is equal to dev dot data set. So save that and reload. And look, there's hello govcon, the message. And it's, it's hopefully it's an H3. Yeah, it is an H3 right there. So if I, if I were to change this, and change this to hello govcon2, let's say, save it, come back here, refresh, then the JavaScript is updating the message. So this, is, this should give you an idea of how to write your own JavaScript apps, configure them as blocks, and plug them, place them as blocks. Um, but then within the JavaScript app, how to extract that configuration that Drupal is trying to give you. And once you do that, you're off to the races, you can use, um, um, what is it? You can, you can use any framework, plain, you can use plain JavaScript, you can use jQuery, you can use ES6, you can use React, you can use Svelte, you can use Angular, whatever you want to use. Um, me, as I said, I like Svelte. So, uh, the last few minutes that I have left, um, I would like to uh, show you the power of Svelte. So if you don't mind, bear with me. This is, so here, you guys, if, if you are, um, if you are, um, what is it, uh, React developers, then I think you would really appreciate this. So first of all, in Svelte, unlike React, there is no such thing as, you don't have to use a use state or local state or global state and, and store, you know, global store and all that, all that. You simply use local variables, JavaScript variables like this. And then you simply template them. So I went to swell.dev and I clicked on REPL and this, this is what came up, right? So um, this is nice because you have a local variable and you, you can template it. But that's not the real power of, Java, of uh, Svelte. The real power is that these are reactive templates. So let me just show you. If I had a button and this button said the title is update and you say on click, do some kind of an update, meaning to say modify this variable. So if I say function update, and all it does is change the name from world to govcon. And so the value of the variable is world. 
and it is using that value in here. And then if I click update, update will simply update the value of the JavaScript local variable. I hit update and look what happened. It got updated. Now, those of you who do not know React will say, uh, well, what's the big deal? That's exactly how it should be, right? And that's right, that's exactly how it should be. But it's not, that's not how it is in React. In React, you, you cannot just update a variable like this. You have to create, use the use state hook and destructure that into a setter and a local variable. And then you have to call the setter in not this update to the variable. And all this, I mean, this is anybody who has done React programming knows what I'm talking about. And they will, they will um, uh, empathize. So uh, React is one such uh, um, framework that has reactivity in its name, but itself is not reactive. Svelte, on the other hand, is truly reactive. You don't have to tell Svelte that uh, I updated this variable. So Svelte is a compiler, so it actually knows when you update this variable. And when you when you hit update, it, it just updates uh, the, the reactive templates in the page. So let me show you another thing where um, the reactivity is quite pervasive. So if I had a uh, had a, an input box, for example, input type, uh, well, you don't even type, text doesn't matter. Let's say, and then I can bind the value. You could say input value is equal to, right, foo. So that's your input, no big deal. What if your value was going to be name? That's also great. But now if I type into it, nothing happens to name. It's a one-way binding. But I can turn it into a two-way binding by simply putting bind colon in front of it. As soon as I do that, I can start typing gov, con, and there you go. It got updated in both the places. If I change it to Jitesh, and it got updated in both the places. I am, and not only that, if I hit update, then name will be ch changed to govcon, Watch what happens. It got converted to the govcon not only here, but also here. So this is two-way binding. So, I mean, this is just a little taste of Svelte. I think you, you it takes about um, three hours if you go through tutorial. This tutorial on svelte.dev is amazing. It teaches you everything you need to know. Uh, and again, you know, uh, like I was saying on this page, and on this description page, I have a link to my YouTube channel. So this is, if you click on youtube.com slash inspire. So this is my YouTube channel. And there are a whole bunch of Svelte videos. And there are like more than two dozen. And you can, of course, there are also Drupal videos and there are videos where Drupal and Svelte are used together. So I would recommend you guys to subscribe to the channel and watch all the videos that are there because uh, it will teach you a lot about Svelte. You can go to swelte.com slash tutorial. And uh, I think you can learn this in about three, four hours. Half a day is all you need uh, to learn Svelte, unlike many other JavaScript frameworks that take you know weeks. Um, I hope you learned something. And uh, I hope you now, uh, when it comes back to Drupal, I hope you guys uh, will use Drupal as is, using its um, its strengths. Um, you don't have to get all your users logged into Drupal, only your staff needs to be logged into Drupal and your users can then be logged into something like Firebase or some Auth0 or something like that. And then uh, you can write uh, JavaScript apps using Svelte. I will end it there and uh, questions. Thank you. Um, I will let the chat go, but I'm going to turn off the recording so that our folks from the captioning department can can stop since we're a little bit over time. Okay. Okay. But feel free to stay and chat, folks. Yes. I'm here. I will.